The Packers are off today and it's back to work tomorrow. I'm Charlie Sykes. Sunday Insight starts right now. Good morning and welcome to Sunday Insight. In the week that was, the nation celebrates Thanksgiving. Retailers celebrated Black Friday. And the federal government issues a worldwide travel warning for Americans, so happy holidays. We start, though, with a national mood, which apparently is cranky. Polls show that Americans are angry, disillusioned with government, and convinced the country is headed in the wrong direction. A recent Bloomberg poll, for instance, found that only 23% of Americans thought the country was headed in the right direction. 69% said we were on the wrong track. The most recent Pew poll found that just 19% of Americans say they can trust the government always or most of the time among the lowest levels in the past half century. Only 29% say that the word honest describes elected officials very or fairly well. And distrust of major institutions, including the news media, runs deep. Joining me on our panel this morning, the Milwaukee Community Journal's Michael Holt, the managing editor of RightWisconsin.com, Colin Roth, Defense Attorney Dan Adams and media trackers Brian Sekma. What's going on with the national mood, Brian? Well, in, in some respects, this isn't totally new yeah. because Americans are cranky, and it's a good thing that they're suspicious of, of big government. And we've been really, over the last almost eight See, years now... See, I'm, I'm old enough to remember when Americans actually, I don't know, were a little bit optimistic, had a little bit more confidence. Well, well that's true. Had I mean, a little and, bit and more you, trust in the people If you look at the last the two presidencies yeah. in particular, they both have ended on a down yeah. note. At least it looks like the Obama administration is going to end on a down note. But we've had a paternalistic approach to government where we've been promised as the American people time and time again, if we enact this policy or this safety net, things will get better. And that just hasn't happened. Okay, the the, the, the Obama presidency began with hope and change, and you look at these numbers across the board, and you get a depressed. I mean, you, you know, you and I are about the same age. We remember when, when Americans had a somewhat rosier sun. What happened? What went wrong? The media. You know, I, I, well. I blame a lot of this on social media. I think people are being duped into believing that the situation is far worse than it really is. You know, Obama has turned around the economy. You know, we have, what, 4.5% unemployment now. We have 12 million people who have insurance today who didn't have insurance. But, you know, there was a poll that came out where they asked, do you support Obamacare? And 80% of white America said, no. Do you... Do you mm -hmm. uh, support okay. affordable well, health care, and they say yes. Okay. But what is the African-American unemployment rate right now in the city of Milwaukee? Among black males, it's 56.8%. Yeah. Okay, so, so happy days here again. Well, we've, always well, been, you know. we've always been Okay, so here, I mean, you know, part of this is the economy, and I do think that it's this loss of confidence. It's not just the media. The reality is that, you know, we are a generation that is, is not absolutely sure that things are going to get better. I think there's a lack of confidence in where is America's place in, in the world, and I think all of that is being reflected. Yeah, you get the sense there's a deep sense of anxiety, particularly, yeah. I think, among middle and lower class and, right. um, Americans. That they're, um, I think Americans in, in what might be considered flyover countries see the erosions of, of their values changing on TV, yeah. changing in the media, but they also see, you know, the factory and, and the manufacturing plant in their town leave leave, right. uh, leave for uh, Mexico or, or China. Right. So there's, and there's the decline of marriage in, the, yeah. in these classes and the decline of different institutions from the church. I think there's there's a loss of community. There, there is a certain alienation, isn't there, as, yeah. as well? The, People are looking at their country and they're going, is this the same country as it used to be and a disconnect between the elites and the average people? Uh, yeah, and I, and I kind of agree that it, yeah. it's not just government. It is the the church. It is uh, it's even the NFL. You know, yeah. it's a, an organization that we should all yeah. rally behind. Uh, it, it's. What I attribute this to is two things. One, we've had over a decade of nonstop warfare mm -hmm. in the Middle East, which, again, right now seems to be rearing its head yeah. again. We, we have made no strides there, seemingly. Uh, so that's one thing. America doesn't seem to be able to get it done. Uh, economically, you know, my generation, millennials, just, you know, half of my friends were living at home after college and were never able to get on those lower, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, on yeah. the ladder of economic... Well, uh, you no, know, part, part of it is also, though, that, that maybe, you know, with my generation and your generation, there were unrealistic expectations that we somehow believed that these good times were going to last forever, that we were entitled to all kinds of success and happiness. And as a result of that, our expectations sort of set us up for disappointment. Yeah, I, mean, I think you know? that's what Michael was talking about, yeah. this, this constant Facebook culture of, you know, you go through your news feed and your friends are always on vacation, they're always at a good restaurant, they're always yeah. at a sporting event, and they're always having a great time. Well, you're confronted 
charged with that again and again and again. Nobody ever documents, you know, doing hard work. Yeah. And now, now you, you, were, you were talking about, you know, how, you know, the Obama had turned the economy around. And the reality is, look, um, we still have 90 million people who are out of the workforce. Oh, yep. It is incredibly uneven. And I do think that, you know, part of this is you have this vast sort of middle class that is kind of wondering, you know, is this country working for me the way it used to? And I think that's and I think that's I think that is a problem for both political parties. I would say it's not. But see, I guess black folks, you know, we're kind of like realistic and pragmatic about this. You know, because we've been sold this bill of goods for decades and generations. When 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 Johnson signed the war on yeah. poverty, or started his war on poverty in nineteen sixty four, yeah. the Black poverty rate was 38%. Yeah, what is Today it Today it's 42%. Okay, so, so what we, does that tell you? we don't see you? any change. Well, this is, this is, this is important because, it, because I think the progressive political project was to convince people to trust government. And I think that, you know, President Obama at one point said, you know, don't listen to those people that are telling you about, uh, you know, incompetent government or tyrannical government. And what we have seen has been the failure of government. So from the point of view of the left, you know, if, if you really want to convince people to give more power to the federal government, the political climate is about as hostile as it's been pretty much forever. Okay, what has your glass half full? What has your glass half empty this week? Let's go around the table. Michael Holt, you're first. Well, my glass is half full because the Public Service Commission rejected a second electricity rate increase in Green Bay. My glass is half empty because last January, the PSC agreed to raise those fixed monthly rates by 80%. Colin Ross. My glass is more than half full. After a wonderful Thanksgiving with family and friends, my glass is half, em half empty because when did we decide, decide to skip Thanksgiving altogether and start Christmas in November? <laughs> Dan Adams. My glass is half full because recently two new Milwaukee County judges, David Feist and Michelle Havis, have taken the bench. These judges couldn't be more different politically, but both have great integrity and a true commitment to justice. My glass is half empty because our country's judicial elections have become completely divorced from discussions of judicial philosophy and temperament. Because of this trend, I, for one, am not looking forward to April's Supreme Court race. Brian. Well, my glass is half full because polls show GOP presidential candidates Marco Rubio and Ted Cruz, both candidates with serious foreign policy proposals, gaining ground in the race for the Republican nomination. But my glass is half empty because foreign policy lightweights Donald Trump and Ben Carson still have sizable amounts of support. Well, my glass is half empty because a university has canceled a yoga class because yoga came from a culture that has experienced oppression, cultural genocide due to colonialism and Western supremacy, really. It's half full because that university is in Canada. Yoga has not actually been banned by a campus into this country yet. Next on Sunday Insight, what are college students so angry about? A revolution on college campuses from Yale to the University of Missouri protests over race and debates over free speech. And it might be about to get a lot worse. Now, you may have heard the terms trigger warnings and microaggressions, terms increasingly common on campuses where students insist that their feelings are easily hurt by a Halloween costume, an email, an article in a school newspaper, or a shouted slur that can be enough to set off these protests. Even in normally quiet Lawrence University up in Appleton, protesters have issued a series of demands that include mandatory cultural sensitivity training for faculty and staff with repercussions if training is not attended, better funding for the diversity center, resources for students of color, and guarantees that a new Israel-Palestine course ensure that, quote, the Palestinian narrative is presented. At Marquette University, officials have now created a system for students to be able to report incidents of microaggression to the authorities. Colin Roth, what is going on here? Well, without broad brushing every yeah, single yeah. incident, I think this, this rise of this almost authoritarian culture in which there are certain topics that cannot be discussed, certain viewpoints that cannot be tolerated, is really something that we ought to be concerned about, particularly in a place like the academy and in college campuses, where it's supposed to be a free exchange of ideas. Okay, Dan Adams, yeah, you follow. We, we've, yeah, yeah, this yeah. is a big issue for me. That we have replaced an achievement of academic, you know, academic achievement for victimization. Yeah. And somehow you get this, you become, uh, you have a state of grace by finding your victimhood somehow. You know, it used to be academia, you would either try to expand the, the bounds of knowledge, no knowledge, right. or you would uh, develop some okay. professional skill. Now it's just finding how you're oppressed within society. Well, and, but it, but it works on campus because generally if you can, you know, play the victim card to get the administration to cave in, a lot of this is very, very reminiscent of the campus revolts back in 1969. But here's the question. 
is there any institution in American life that has been more consistently dominated by the left, <laughs> by liberals, that has spent more efforts in being uh, diverse the, and multicultural, what, what, and, so, and, yet, and yet, you know, why is this happening at the most liberal institutions why, in America? Why it's happening is because there has been a bureaucracies built on this idea of perpetual victimization, yeah. and now the chickens are really coming home to roost because these bureaucrats need something to do. Well, it's interesting that many of the demands are for more bureaucracies and more bureaucrats, interestingly enough. Why is this happening? No, Charlie, this is what happens when everybody gets a participation yeah. trophy, and they okay. get a ribbon, and now they want to go to, off to college, and they realize that they have to be adults now, and there's some things that are going to offend you that you just have to shrug off. Yeah. Now, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that it's important to be culturally aware. It's important right. to be culturally sensitive, and it's not polite to yell slurs at someone. But at the same time, you don't let other people's bad behavior slow you down and stop you from achieving your own goals and what you want to do, and that's what's happening in these college campuses. Okay, Michael Holt. Well, I don't know about this microaggressive yeah. stuff, but... But I'm, I'm happy to see some of this activity on the college campus. That's the college campus I attended many, many years ago, where you see activism, where you see students involved. Yeah, but the world and has engaged. changed in the last 50 years. No, it hasn't changed. What we has? Reversed, oh, really? We reverted our, on college campuses. On college campuses. You know, uh, you know my, my late son staged demonstrations yeah. at Lake Forest College to get a black professor to get African American studies. If you go back are, now, are college, they dropped all of those programs. Are colleges and universities oppressive, racist institutions? Is America? Yeah, but the college campuses I'm talking about. Some of them are. Okay. But, you know, so all of the years of progress haven't, haven't, haven't changed and anything in the environment? And they're not all liberal, liberal institutions either. I mean, they're far from liberal institutions. I, I well, think if you call know. Yale a, an right. oppressive place, that's... That you're jumping the shark. Well, here. well, and you know, you mentioned Yale, and one of the images we have with that student who's screaming at the master, and this, this, be, this all came from his wife writes an email saying, "Hey, maybe we should be tolerant and respect other people's <laughs> ideas." It was about Halloween costumes, and he was basically saying, "If you don't like a Halloween costume, look the other way." And you had a young woman on campus screaming at him, you know, the F word and shut up and everything. Um, and and first of all, it's Yale. You are talking about some of the most privileged students, not just in the country. Well, you're you're talking reality, about some of the most privileged. <laughs> well, exactly. There's a little bit of a disconnect. But that's not the case at UWM. Well, I think I'm going to make a prediction right now that you are going to be seeing more of these campus uh, disputes all you know throughout the, the, the spring because number one, it works. Uh, the campus uh, administration is spring loaded to, to cave in and give in to all of these demands. Plus, we have spent 50 years encouraging people to think of themselves as victims and to nurture their own sense of grievance. And you are right, the chickens are coming home to roost. Now, you may not want to hear it, but we will tell you anyway. Let's hand out some unsolicited advice. Michael Holt, you're first. Well, mine is to all the dummies who embrace the politically <sighs> motivated proposal to maintain a data bank on Muslims. I think America would better serve if we kept a data bank on stupid people. Maybe too big. <laughs> Colin Roth. My advice is for Republican voters to take a look at the news, read about the events in the world, and please ask yourself <laughs> honestly, do you really want to nominate someone with the temperament, judgment, and experience of Donald Trump? Dan Adams. Want to succeed in public opinion polls? The rise of Trump and Bernie Sanders shows that populism, with special attention to fanning the flames of fear and resentment, goes a long way. Luckily, populists don't win presidential elections. We hope. Brian Sigma. My unsolicited yeah. advice is for President Barack Obama. Let's not let France be known as a tougher nation <laughs> than we are when it comes to stopping radical Islamic terrorism. Well, my advice is if your drunken, bigoted uncle starts spouting off at dinner about something that he saw on the internet, just turn up the volume on the football game. Next on Sunday Insight, what is the biggest surprise so far this year? We still have more than a month to go in 2015, and we're not ready yet for our annual year in review show, but let's take a quick look back on the year so far. What has happened or not happened that has been the biggest surprise for you so far in 2015, Dan Adams? Well, I think it's the, the dualism between the, uh, the fall of Walker and the rise, the concurrent rise of Paul and Ryan. I mean, when this year came in, we thought, well, this is Scott Walker's year. You know, he's, he's already polling well. He's going to uh, do well in Iowa. Mm, yeah. He's going to be the leading Wisconsinite in the national media. 
he evaporated uh, before our eyes. And concurrently, Paul Ryan is the now, what the third most pop, uh, uh, powerful person in well, the that, country. Well, that's pretty good because trust me, in January of, of this year, nobody saw Paul Ryan as the Speaker of the House of Representatives by the end of the year. Brian Sickman. Well, it may seem obvious, but at first I didn't think Donald Trump was going to get into the presidential yeah. race, and then I thought he'd be out shortly after he got in. And now here we are going into getting very close, scarily close to the first votes being cast in the 2016 presidential race, and the guy is still at the top of a lot of these polls. Okay, your big surprise. Yeah, they stole both of mine. I was saying yeah. the rise of Trump yeah. and the fall of Scott Walker. I didn't think he would be leading yeah. as early as he did, and it would drop out so quick. But I think also the, on the local level, all of these mergers, you know, the, the yeah. political, I mean, or the economic landscape, philanthropic landscape from Milwaukee is going to change dramatically in 216 because we might yeah. turn around there's going to be just one corporation running the Co whole city. Colin Ross. Yeah, back, back to presidential politics, yeah. I'd say the, the fact that Hillary Clinton is basically unopposed, how it looked earlier in the year right. with, the, with the email scandal and the various mm -hmm. things and the, and the Biden momentum right. and murmurs, it sounded, it looked like, you know, with her unfavorables going up and up and up and dishonesty up and up and up, it seemed like she wasn't as inevitable as she is at this point. Well, I mean, obviously, and I, the, Again, this is not terribly original. You know, what, what I find most surprising is because you usually think that, that campaigns follow a certain trajectory and mm -hmm. a certain pattern. The rise of Donald Trump, but the persistence of Donald Trump, yeah. it doesn't matter what offensive things he says. It doesn't matter who he insults. It doesn't matter if he makes a racist comment or a sexist comment or if he makes up stories. It doesn't seem to affect his, his polling, which suggests to me something about the American electorate. And I, and, I, and I think that's what's genuinely surprising, because you think that at a certain point, when, if somebody does something, you know, when he, when he insulted uh, uh, John McCain, said, you know, I like people who weren't captured. Everybody's going, well, that's the end of him. You know, when he gets in a fight with Megyn Kelly, people think, well, okay, obviously that's going to hurt him. There's something going on in the American electorate that we haven't seen before. Now, maybe it will settle down again. But I, 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 if you would have asked me at the beginning of the year whether you would ever see somebody with his temperament, with his behavior in this mm -hmm. campaign, I, know, rising and, and being in first place for this long. I mean, I, 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 think don't, we I, saw don't, I don't know of anybody. I think say. we saw it with Huey Long in the 1930s. I mean, yeah, right? But he was the last populist kind of dicta dictator type person in, in American life. But it's yeah, on both sides. Yeah. I think there's a cynicism in, in, you know, the dishonesty numbers of Hillary Clinton and the dishonesty of D Donald Trump, you see, as the two yeah. front runners. Well, and, and that, that says more, I think, unfortunately, about the electorate than it does about the candidates. I mean, they yeah. are what they are. It's the, it's the willingness of people to tolerate yeah, all of that. Usually you pay a price for stupidity. But you, now we've seen <laughs> a, a influx of stupidity on both sides of the aisle, and there's no polling price to be paid yet. Okay. What is it you don't get this week? Let's go around the table. Michael Holt. You are first. What I want to get is how members of the University of Illinois White Student Union can intelligently say tracking and categorizing black students is not intimidating or racist. Colin Roth. What I don't get is how Wisconsinites could consider returning Russ Feingold to the Senate given his lockstep support of the Obama-Clinton foreign policy. Dan Adams. Well, not to be trite, but I don't get the retail bonanza that the Christmas and holiday season has become. I guess partly it's because I'm cheap and I hate shopping, but shouldn't there be more emphasis on celebrations of faith, family, and friends? Yeah, no presents for you. Uh, Brian Sigma. <laughs> well, what I don't get is why the Obama administration would encourage intelligence analysts to, quote, cook the books on intelligence so the White House's preferred narrative wouldn't be disrupted by facts on the ground. I thought intelligence estimates mattered to liberals. Hmm. Well, what I don't get is how I ended up being cast as Ebenezer Scrooge in WTMJ's version of the Christmas Carol, which is going to be taped this Tuesday. And by the way, Colin Roth is playing young Scrooge. <laughs> Next on Sunday Insight, our panel picks the winners and losers of the week. First, here's your morning news update. It's time for our panel to pick the winners and losers of the week. Michael Holt, you're first. A loser, Donald Trump supporters who don't realize the asinine rat rant that he tweeted was exactly what Dalen Wolf proclaimed days before he murdered nine black church members in Charleston. My winners, all the non-black people who took advantage of our holiday last weekend. Oh, it's not black. Friday is not our holiday. They stole something again from us. I knew you'd play that card. Colin Roth. My winner this week is Brett Favre and his historic return to Lambeau Field. What a scene. My losers are all the shoppers who went out on Black Friday and didn't get as big a deal as you could have if you lived in neighboring states. You can thank Wisconsin's price police and the minimum markup law for higher prices. Dan Adams. My winners are the 785,000 
or so refugees who have settled in America since 9-11, only a dozen or so of whom have been arrested or removed for terrorism concerns. A small fraction. I'm glad these people are here partaking in our amazing experiment that is the USA. My loser sitting Louisiana Senator David Vitter, a Republican whose 2007 prostitution scandal finally cost him his career in public life. Vitter badly lost last week's governor's race in his state by a whopping 12 points. Brian Sigma. Well, my winners this week are State Senator Dewey Strobel and State Rep Rob Brooks, who recently introduced legislation to more efficiently distribute state and federal highway dollars to local governments. The reform will save taxpayers money and make transportation dollars go further without increasing your taxes. My loser is State Senator Chris Larson, who never misses a chance to politicize anything. And this week attacked Governor Scott Walker for daring to call for a better refugee screening process before Syrian refugees are allowed into Wisconsin. Well, my winner, all the families who were able to get together for Thanksgiving this year. Loser, the folks who spent Thanksgiving camped out for Black Friday. You people need to rethink your life choices. Thanks for joining us. Enjoy for my radio show Monday morning. It's on News Radio 620 WTMJ from 8:30 until noon. Have a great week.